Hi, everyone, and, and welcome to the Diatom Web Academy. And I just really can't start, um, I can't begin without um, acknowledging, again, this most recent violence, again, an instance of police violence in our country. And many of us, many people have experienced violent event after violent event. And let's all of us take part in ending this, um, you know, by being aware and being present and doing what we can do. So thank you. And um, I continue to value these webinars as a great way to learn about diatoms, to be exposed to new research, and to expand my professional and personal connections with all of you. So thank you. It's such a treat to see your names coming from around the world and your faces. Hello, Sylvia. And I wish I could see everybody all at once. Um, really, you've been sparkles of light helping me get through the, these really challenging times. And um, I just wanna announce um, that we will, um, the Society for Freshwater Science is sponsoring a uh, taxon page workshop. And uh, David had, has put the link for that in, in the chat. Um, Marina Potapova, Paula Fury and I will be hosting that workshop. And please check out that link to look at the date and also the registration deadline. We're going to be making pages for diatom.org. Um, today, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Pat Kasalik. Pat is a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at CU Boulder. Um, he's the director of the CU Museum of Natural History. And his work, he, Pat works on taxonomy, syst systematics, and the evolution of diatoms with a focus on biogeography. His recent publications span diatom lineages in Southeast Asia, China, Russia, South America, and the Antarctic. Um, Pat typically spends his summers teaching a phycology course at University of Michigan Biological Station. And he's also the taxonomic editor of diatombase.org, which is a online catalog of diatom names, their types, ecology, descriptions, and distributions. Um, today, Pat will present the talk, Grades and Clades, Important Insights and Crucial Gaps in Our Understanding of Diatom Phylogeny and Classification. And I see David Williams is in the audience, so I understand that this talk is really specifically for you, David. So, um, and somehow brings in um, Pat and David's recent exchanges and conversations towards resolving uh, diatom phylogeny. So, thank you, Pat. Great, thanks, Sarah. And thanks for everyone for joining, I appreciate it. Um, so this is, uh, what I'm trying to do in this talk is integrate a variety of projects that I've been involved with recently, recently being the last 10 years or something like that. It, it draws heavily on a project on rampant homoplasy, but it uh, addresses a number of other projects and, uh, and a large number of contributors uh, to this from many of the countries that Sarah just listed. This should this title should be focused a little bit more on RAFID diatom phylogeny and classification. I'm not going to talk a little bit. I'm not going to talk about some of those other groups. And uh, so, uh, and then I'm gonna, first I'm going to cover some ground that Dave Williams covered uh, uh, a while ago in his talk in this forum and uh, about classification. And then I'll talk about some of the specific examples. So. Diatoms, the classification of diatoms has been all over the map. They've been put with a wide variety of groups. Uh, uh, you know, here's a classification of diatoms with respect to desmids. Uh, they've been put in a whole variety of areas. But finally, uh, people started to look at the classification of diatoms specifically. And there have been numerous approaches over the years, as you might imagine. Um, those a large number of features have been highlighted uh, in maybe some of the early classification schemes 
uh, single features that then evolved into more of an integrative approach. I do, and I'm gonna to try to represent some of these uh, classification schemes with some drawings. And I want to identify that the drawings or the groups that we're going to identify are monophyletic groups. Those groups that have an ancestor and all of its descendants and not paraphyletic groups that includes an ancestor and some of its descendants. So we're trying to get a classification system that reflects the evolutionary history of, of uh, lineages and recognize those as, uh, as uh, units that deserve names. And um, so some history, just to go through some of the early history, uh, some diatom classification schemes were based on shape and symmetry. I'm gonna to speak to this uh, in a little bit, but uh, these, these uh, representatives here in these light micrographs, Eunosia, Epithemia, and Cymbella, were all grouped together uh, based on this asymmetry about the apical axis in the early days. Others looked at the chloroplast structure of diatoms and differentiated between those that have small uh, discoid chromatophores, many small discoid chromatophores versus a, a few large chromatophores. And so there were classification schemes put together that reflected uh, those characteristics. Uh, Marashovsky, who looked at all kinds of uh, classification systems, uh, developed one on whether diatoms moved or not. And so, again, uh, just a, a wide way, a wide range of ways that diatoms have been classified by these uh, earlier investigators. I want to say that just because we might not embrace the some of these uh, some of these elements of their classification systems are still in use today, and just because they were early doesn't mean they weren't. Um, uh, uh, useful uh, advances in our understanding of diatoms and their classification. Of course, uh, a system that lasted for quite some time was by Schutt and Karsten, who represented two great groups of diatoms, the centric diatoms and the pennate diatoms. And they had information that integrated across a number of different, a uh, number of different features. And this was in place for about you know, 120 years uh, that we looked at diatoms in this way. I'm, I'm of that age that this was the system in place when I started working on diatoms. Um, and then we can try to reflect that, uh, those ideas into these different kinds of diagrams. So uh, this is a classification system by uh, Steinecke back in the early 30s. And he recognized centric diatoms here that were monophyletic. He might have seen that there are two groups within the centric diatoms, but they were monophyletic. And the pennate diatoms also monophyletic, even though the quote unquote araphid diatoms were non monophyletic. Um, and even, but even people who embraced this centric pennate split um, uh, didn't, uh, didn't actually, they might have said they did, but their classification systems did not. So this is a Siemensen. In 1979, he suggested that there was a centric pennate split in his classification, but in fact, in this system, here are quote unquote centric diatoms here. They're non-monophyletic. Pennate diatoms are monophyletic, but interestingly in, in uh, Siemensen's approach, the evolution of the raphe uh, looked like it, he was suggesting it happened twice here in the Unotiaceae and separately in the other raphid diatoms that we know. So probably still the most cited classification system used by diatomists is Round, Crawford, and Mann. It recognized centrics, araphids, and, um, and raphid diatoms. It was actually a, a, a system that had been developed quite some time ago, although they didn't reference it by um, H.L. Smith in the 1870s, who recognized um, raphid diatoms what we would now know as araphid diatoms and uh, centric diatoms. And so uh, all we know from theirs is that they, they suggested there were some ur diatoms that led to these three great groups and their relationships not, not straightforward. Then we had entered a period of time where there was molecular data and um, a number of different ideas and, and uh, hypotheses put forward. Um, this idea of centric diatoms being non-monophyletic. Uh, we might call them centric, but they're not a group that we would call centric and a monophyletic um, pennate group. Um, some some de more detailed analysis suggested that even these centric lineages were non-monophyletic. The A-raphids were non-monophyletic, but just, just 
panates, and raphid diatoms were monophyletic. And then Terry et al. Uh, in 2015 came up with a, a very similar tree as the one I just talked about. And you can see here how some of those groups uh, match up to a variety of different approaches that have been taken through history. And I'm gonna use this, uh, uh, this terio tree and some of its elements to talk about uh, relationships in the raphid diatoms, which seems to be monophyletic and, uh, and quote unquote, a natural group. Another, another, some terminology we need to cover is uh, what's the difference between a homology, which is a similar feature that's been, been shared by common ancestry versus a homoplasy where the features might look similar, but they are derived, they're not derived from a common ancestor. And homoplasy often um, results from convergent evolution, not entirely, but many times, that's the explanation. So, um, so we want, uh, we're, we're looking at formal classification systems and we're trying to understand their relationships. There, there are other ways to group things. There are functional groups we could, we could put, we could identify. Um, we could create artificial classification systems that may be, sorry, could be quote unquote useful, but they're not, not reflective of phylogeny. So um, they may reflect more morphological grades than evolutionary clades. And so in our formal classification system, we're looking for evolutionary clades, monophyletic groups. So I'm gonna, in this talk, I'm gonna talk about three different types of features, three examples, if you will, where we have looked at features, uh, some that are con of convenience, some that are quote unquote conservative, and some that are complex and see how they map against the tree of life. And in each of these cases, my contention is that in the examples I'm gonna share with you, that these features have been homoplastic and not that they've occurred once or twice, but uh, enough times that we would might call them rampant uh, homoplastic characters. So let's talk about symmetry and I'm gonna, which has been a characteristic used quite a long time in diatoms to classify them. And I'm gonna talk about gonfanemoid symmetry, symmetry about the uh, asymmetry about the transequal axis and asymmetry in um, that's wedge shaped in girdle view. So if you look at in the biraphid diatoms, you look in, you look in raphid diatoms, you'll find that, there, that uh, this, this symmetry evolved many times. So there are two lineages within the symboloid diatoms. That's right, I didn't misspeak. Didymosphenia here is a symboloid diatom that has secondarily become gonfanemoid. But Didymosphenia and gonfosymbolopsis, and this is just a card, by the way, from the new taxon file at the Academy of Natural Sciences, which I just put in here to give a plug for that resource, which is a um, super resource if you're not using it, it's just a great resource. Both Gumphosymbolopsis and Didymosphenia are symboloid diatoms and independently within the symboloid lineage have uh, become uh, gonfanemoid. Within the gonfanemoid diatoms that we might know, gonfanema and gonfanese and gonfanella, uh, uh, there was the evolution of this symmetry. But there are other lineages as well where, I'm uh, sorry for the uh, light pictures here, where. Um, uh, the symmetry occurred. So in Gomphosphenia, for example, a diatom that has similar, um, uh, that has similar uh, valve, you have similar symmetry, but valve distinction is quite different than uh, Gomphonema and its relatives. And then there's a, there's a lineage of attacks of that are um, found on the, as epi, epizoic on sea turtles. And there's a couple of lineage or a couple of genera here that are close related to each other that are all um, gonfanemoid in their symmetry. And that lineage of these three genera is also um, a, an independent event in the uh, evolution of gonfanemoid symmetry. So if we look at this, um, we can look at uh, twice within the symboloid diatoms um, gonfanemoid symmetry evolved. It happened in gonfanema and its relatives. It happened in this epizoic lineage. It happened separately in gonfosphenia. 
there's another marine lineage of diatoms that uh, this symmetry evolved and uh, it happened also in Roycus phenia seven times in biriffid diatoms. So uh, if that's the case, uh, we would not use gonfanemoid symmetry. We would, we would indicate that characteristic is homoplasius within the raphid diatoms. And we would not recognize a group of those diatoms altogether uh, as a distinct gonfanemoid diatoms. There are, they have arrived at that, that characteristic independently. So um, a second example, what we might call conservative features. So that was that was a convenient that was a it was a feature of convenience. So simple to use symmetry, but maybe in this example, uh, using symmetry is not a good one to um, recognize a monophyletic group. So um, another feature that another type of feature is that people have thought of to be conservative, that these features are so important in the lifestyle or for some aspect of the diatoms that um, they must be conservative. And therefore, if they're conservative, uh, we should be able to uh, uh, establish classification systems based on them. So one is the raphe. Everyone, the you know, raphe diatoms appear to evolve once. And some people think that aspects of the, of the raphe system are so must be so conservative that we we can use that as a as a, as a way to uh, group things. One of those aspects is the number of the raphe. So uh, so this has been um, uh, one way we thought about the raphe system. So in terms of monorapha diatoms, uh, you know, there's been uh, some a lot of interesting thought and papers written about the, its evolution. Some people have thought that monoraphid diatoms are primitive to biraphid diatoms. We went from no raphe to one raphe to two raphes. Others have thought that the monoraphid condition is derived and we went from a, a lack of a raphe to a biraphid condition to a more derived monoraphid condition. And there's been a number of um, a number of approaches to establish that the monoraphid condition is derived, uh, including these phylogenies that I'll show you, but not, not exclusively. So uh, there is, as you, as you all know, a lot of diversity in monoraphid diatoms. You know, we have things like Cochineus that um, has this, you know, incredibly uh, interesting valve morphology. Uh, the, freshwater diet, the freshwater representatives are kind of boring compared to the marine ones. But they have a, uh, you know, they have a really interesting um, uh, uh, organization about the valve that's allowed them to be really great epiphytes. Agnathes, in the strict sense, you know, these very large diatoms that uh, occupy unique habitats like uh, aerophilus systems, um, and they also have uh, unique um, growth forms and. Um, sexual reproduction. Then in many of the freshwater groups that you know, like Acnanthidium, or which grow on these small peduncles, or Planathidium, or a lot of marine uh, monoraphid genera as well. So if we say where, where is, you know, and, and, there's a, and there is a classification system that's still in use that recognizes monoraphid diatoms as a group. And, um, so are monoraphid diatoms monophyletic? So uh, this, is, this little blue line here is kind of a, a, a shorthand for um, the raphid diatom relationships of major lineages. And this little green box is just telling us we're gonna be looking in that zone here. So uh, at the top of this uh, tree, there's the Unosha and then um, uh, Bacillariales and, and ultimately the naviculoid diatoms up here. And what this shows us is that there's some, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, the, here's Agnanthes in the strict sense that's closely related to Bacillariales way at the base of this tree. And then we have Agnanthidium and Cochineus here and a different group of Cochineus here. 
And then if we look in just this lineage that includes the, which we might call the, a family that includes Starnius and its relatives, um, at least two different genera um, separated of Monterey for diatoms, just in that particular part of the tree. So we might say that uh, the, the monorafid condition evolved at least a five times. And I'll talk about this sixth time in just a second. Um, again, mono, this monorafid condition is a <clears throat> grade of organization, not a clade of, of relationships or related diatoms. And something that uh, we will come back to is this idea of agnanthes a monorafid diatom more like the more like the naviculales being found in the bacillariales. So in addition to the number, people just thought the rafe system is a conservative character. It must be a conservative character and it's only evolved once, looks like. Uh, and um, it must be a, a um, um, something that we can hang our hat on. But I want to introduce you to um, a genus of diatoms that, that's been named Sinoperonia. Um, you know, we've seen, again, uh, even though there may be loss within um, a rafe system in the modern rafe diatoms, and maybe that happens several times, usually within that genus, if it's modern rafe, it's modern rafe. But what I'm going to introduce to you here is a single species that can be birafid, monorafid and araphid. So uh, this, this diatom was, um, I had scientists from both uh, China and Russia in my lab at the same time, and both of them, it turns out, were working on this um, genus. The Chinese person was working on in uh, southern China, and the Russian person was working from, on samples from Vietnam. And both handed me manuscripts within about 10 days of each other uh, describing this diatom at, at a variety of taxonomic levels. So uh, in these samples, you can see diatoms with a rafe system. You can see those up here at the top. The rafe is very distinct and particularly distinct are the terminal nodules. So uh, in, uh, this is a, a, a dark area that's associated with where the helictoglossa is internally. And then there were, there were um, specimens that had no rafe system and um, so we thought oh, this must be a monorafid diatom. So we thought. So, uh, so one of the ways you could get at this was that you can see these terminal nodules quite distinctly in girdle view. So uh, here we could see a frustule and we can see the terminal nodules on one valve, but not on the other. So it gave us, um, you know, support of the idea that th this was a monorafid diatom. But then we started to look at other valves and here is a frustule and this has no terminal nodules. There are no rafe systems on this frustule. And there are others that are bi -rafid. So again, just by looking at whether they have terminal nodules, we can, we can understand whether they have a rafe system and we can find out that this diatom uh, is able to um, produce monorafid, arafid and bi -rafid frustules. The genus uh, structure is a lot like Peronia uh, that you might know uh, from acid habitats in the Northern Hemisphere and actually Southern Hemisphere as well. Uh, this diatom has a very kind of distinctive labiate process, not a big thickening around the uh, labiate process like we might see in others. So it's a member of the uh, Unoshiales. And, um, and we found if we did some counts of frustules that uh, the monorafid condition is uh, the majority of those valves are those frustules, but um, there's quite a few birafid and arafid examples. So, uh, so here we think, you know, the presence of a rafe system, it must be conservative. In fact, uh, this one species can have all the conditions of a pennate diatom with respect to its rafe system. There's some other examples of this as well, this kind of reduction in rafe uh, system. Um, a genus, two genera from, that I'm going to show you here uh, from South America uh, has just this, 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 I think this was originally described as a, as a uh, fragilaria. 
And you can see just a small RAFI system here, right at the valve uh, face mantle uh, junction, hard to see uh, in valve view. And uh, this diatom here has no RAFI or just a teeny tiny RAFI. Uh, this genus was described by Carlos Wetzel et al. So I wanna ask you a question. Uh, let's say you have diagno diagnosed a group and you said this characteristic diagnoses this group. Would you expect that every, everything you assign to that group needs to have that feature that you've said diagnoses it? It seems like you would want to, right? You'd, you'd say, okay, this is the, my genus. My genus has these, th these characteristics. And therefore I'm going, everything that goes into that genus has to have that characteristic or those characteristics that diagnose it. I'm gonna make a case here that that's not necessarily true. So uh, through secondary loss, you could imagine a, a, a diatom that's closely related to the things you just uh, circumscribed into a, a group, but maybe uh, doesn't have the feature that you use to uh, uh, diagnose it. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the genus Dipura. Dipura is the only endemic genus to Hawaii, at least in our current classification system. Um, and um, it was described as an araphid diatom. It grows in caves, in little cracks and little seeps in caves, really low light uh, environment. And Steve Main uh, described this 20 years ago. So when a number of us were um, uh, in Hawaii studying the freshwater diatom floor of Hawaii, we came across this, we brought it back and we actually got it to be cultured uh, here in Boulder. You can see the size diminution series. Here's the, some of the largest valves and, and here must be the, the smallest valve of this diatom. And, um, and we were able to see this diatom through its size diminution series. And because we were able to get it in culture through its ontogenetic series of laying down its, its cell walls. At no point in the, uh, at this diatom's life cycle is there a RAFI expressed. Never have seen it. When you do, when you sequence, you put this into uh, a four gene tree here, the quote unquote centric diatoms up here, a raphid diatoms here and raphid diatoms here. Dipura, at least with molecular data is shown to be well within the raphid diatoms. This is not like, oh, it, you know, maybe it's this, you know, an a raphid or maybe it's a raphid diatom. This is deep within the naviculoid diatom lineage. So even though dipura does not have a raphi, we classify it as a raphid diatom. So in this case, the number of raphi systems per frustral can be plastic from none to one to two. It seems at least in this diatom, it's uh, it maybe quote unquote easy to lose it. There has been RAFI loss in a number of other RAFID diatoms. And if, you know, I don't know what to call cyanoperonia other than a, a unoshioe diatom, but if it's considered a monorafid diatom, the monorafid condition has probably uh, happened at least seven times. Well, what about complex? So I've talked about convenience and I've talked about. Um, conservative types of characters. What about complex characters? So let's think of in our mind's eye that we think, man, that setup is so complex that it could have only happened once. I mean, how, you know, so let's think of, um, let's think of the amphoroid diatoms. Now, um, if I have any students of mine on this call, just I'm, I'm going to put out a little message. That I'd love to know where the, where the Petri dishes are in our lab these days. But since I don't have a Petri dish, I'm going to have to use a slide box. So most diatoms are put like this, put together like this, like a Petri dish. And, um, but in the amphoroid diatoms, they've evolved to where the, the, the valves are like this. And they filled in that backspace with a wide variety of girdle bands. 
So in the case you can see, so in that situation, you can see on a frustral, both valves in, in the same plane of view. That must be complex. And that the, the, the uh, saying goes that they must have just evolved once. And there is a ton of morphological diversity in, in forms we include in amphora or amphora, amphoroid diatoms, amphora and halamphora. And not only in the valve morphology, which there are you know, just a lot, you can see here maybe uh, those girdle bands that are filling in on the backside of, uh, of amphoras to make them have that, that appearance. There's also quite a diversity in chloroplast morphology as well within these groups. <clears throat> so um, again, if you take uh, that, and if you, if you wanna study uh, what was the evolution of this group, uh, again, and we're in this part of the tree of raphid diatoms, and I apologize for this group. So here's, say it's actually a very similar tree to what we just saw with Dipura. Here's, um, uh, um, Araphid diatoms here are unoshioid diatoms going up through quote unquote naviculoid diatoms. We can see that there have been four different, um, uh, the evolution of, four, of amphoroid symmetry, this complex feature has happened at least four times in this lineage in, in, in biraphid diatoms. In fact, um, it's happened a number of other times as well. Um, it's happened in a navicula. This diatom has been called a variety of names. The last time it was called an amphora because of its symmetry, but the valve morphology suggests it's more closely related to navicula. So four plus one. There's the genus Unophora that is um, amphoroid, uh, but it has. Um, labiate processes, it's a, a unoshioid diatom. Uh, so, and, and there's others have been, that have described a unoshioid, or u, unoshioid diatoms with amphoroid symmetry. I think Mark Edlin has done that as well. So at least six times in the, in the raphid diatoms has amph this complex morphology has evolved independently. So uh, at least five, if you include Unoshiales, uh, probably six or maybe seven uh, different independent origins of that of that uh, feature. And maybe you know maybe it would be interesting to know whether those are actually the same thing, quote unquote. We we've been so conservative in our terminology in diatoms that we give the same name maybe to many different structures. So. Um, there has been a lot, let's call it rampant homoplasy with a wide variety of features <clears throat> that might be considered convenient, conservative, complex. Anything, anywhere, you know, you could get into some other examples from a couple to up to seven times. And um, we, we would not, based on these results, we would not, uh, we would not create a classification system of gumpenemoid diatoms monoraphid diatoms or amphoroid diatoms based on this. And, um, you know, it would be really interesting to get into some of the, uh, how, for example, how does monoraphy uh, happen? And does it happen by the same mechanism in each of the different lineages we uh, saw? So now I'm gonna turn my attention, let me check my time to uh, some gaps. Now we could spend weeks on this Zoom call, talking about gaps in our knowledge of diatoms and their classification systems. So I don't want to suggest that <clears throat> these are the gaps. These are just a few gaps that occurred to me in thinking about um, uh, areas of uh, raphid diatom evolution that I think are deserving of my time and maybe other people's time. Those gaps I'm going to talk about are related to large genera. And I'm going to look at the base of the diatom tree, the raphid diatom tree of life. And then um, this um, idea, what I've 
written here as relating evolution with revolution, what I, it's not some kind of uh, socialistic manifesto, but it's related to um, looking at um, uh, the idea of adaptive radiation. So um, I'll just say, I'm just gonna state it plainly and, and uh, you know we can create some controversy to say, diatomists are too conservative in their recognition of genera. <clears throat> and we've got some just outrageous examples of large genera that we just keep plowing taxa into or large groups um, without apparent any kind of thought about um, unraveling them and maybe identifying um, uh, a finer re resolved taxonomy. But I'll, I'll just give you a couple of examples. So I'm just going to list um, a couple of large genera, tell you approximately how many taxa there are in that genera, then say, how many, how many of those taxa do we have SEMs for? And then, this, and, and then how many records, how many taxa are in GenBank records? And I should say that just because we have SEM records and just because there are GenBank records doesn't necessarily mean that um, uh, those taxa are ready to be analyzed. It could be just there's one SEM or it could be just part of a gene that's sitting in GenBank. So this is the best case scenario uh, uh, demonstrating sort of the gaps in our knowledge. So here's the genus Pinularia. Four, over 4,200 tax have been described, about 175 of them. This, and this is this estimate from SEM is from Gall et al. and uh, Henderson and Reimer, um, and then some other uh, estimates. And then how many gen bank records? And we really, you know, for this genus, we only know a small fraction of that genus in terms of the data we have for morphology and uh, molecular data. Uh, Symbella is a little better, about 2,000 taxa, about 400 of them have been illustrated with SEM, and there's about 100, just over 100 uh, taxa represented in GenBank records. And Unosha um, is, you know, in between uh, uh, Pinularia and, um, and Symbella. Uh, what I want to point out here is that we rarely have, we have so few GenBank records of Unosha. So this is kind of a call to say we have uh, we have a lot of work to do, and one of the what I feel is like one of the big gaps in our knowledge base about diatoms are these very large genera, and um, so <clears throat> that's one. The second area I want to talk about is the uh, base of the raphid diatom tree. So that's represented here. Here's some. Araphid diatoms, the raphid diatoms start here, and this is kind of at that base of the tree. And the first group I want to talk about is the Bacillariales. Now, in this case, there's a ton of, uh, of GenBank records. Uh, there's just a paper recently that kind of summarized this by David Mann and Andrzej Witkowski and Ed Terrio and a large number of other folks. Uh, but um, again, uh, much of those data are, um, it, it's, there's, it, it's surprising how little documentation there is for that group. So uh, the, the title of that paper was ripe for reassessment. But in fact, uh, if you wanted to try to get a biogeography or, or even to see what were they looking at when they took that sequence in GenBank, almost no documentation for that. And then for this group, um, this is one of the, of all the work that's been done with molecular uh, uh, data, the, that, that the, that Agnanthes comes embedded within this lineage is something that we really need to get our heads around. You know, what, what are the, how are the data uh, pushing that relationship? There is almost no morphological evidence, no morphological, no cytological evidence, no no uh, ideas about the, the patterns of sexual reproduction, no support for that from morphology. And that's not usually the case in many of our studies. So it'd be really interesting to know more about that particular area. Um, also down here are uh, the prim this one group of those amphoroid diatoms, <clears throat> pardon me. And um, looking at, uh, 
uh, Eunophora and just what is going on at, at this part of the tree. Is Eunophora really part of the Eunociales? Is it part of this group of uh, amphoroid diatoms? And as I mentioned, uh, it's amazing how little we know about um, eunotioid diatoms, uh, given how big the genus is. Now, I want to make the point here, and I'm going to introduce a, a, a just a, I can't help myself to talk about biogeography for a moment. This lineage is um, an important lineage. Th this group, these groups we just talked about, this is like the evolution of the Rafi. So what was going on? What was the experiments? What were going on in here in terms of natural history for these lineages? And if we're going to study this, we need to um, we need to broaden our horizons. This is, as a matter of fact, this Eunotia, Eunotiales is not a northern hemisphere problem. This is a southern hemisphere problem, and we need to get collaborators across the southern hemisphere to work on this problem. So, because uh, uh, this group. Uh, of all uh, diatoms, actually all diatoms, has the highest level of endemism of any lineage of uh, diatoms. 60% of the genera uh, in the Eunociales are endemics. Um, there are, so there are seven uh, endemic genera, uh, five of which are in, in South America. So this is, you know, if, we're good, if somebody wants to work on this problem, and I think this is a hugely important problem, uh, there are endemic genera from across South America that are uh, that need to be studied, and then there are other genera from other places that are that are also endemics, uh, Asia, Africa, uh, so uh, and uh, New Zealand, and so um, it's really an important element to think about when we want to tackle some of these groups, is that we really need to take a broad perspective and look to see where are the, uh, the, uh, the, the, where's the diversity of these lineages? And then finally, I wanna talk about um, adapt, uh, the idea of adaptive radiation. And you could put this in the same category as the ideas related to uh, amphoroid diatoms in the sense that, uh, you know, there are some genera that are extremely morphologically diverse. And the only reason that we have them uh, uh, classified together is because they share a particular feature. So in Diplonese, for example, which has about a thousand species, we have this, we have these canals running alongside the, um, the uh, axial area. But the, the marine Diplonese are so different than the freshwater Diplonese and the Diplonese that we see uh, like the Margina striata group, unbelievably different from a more traditional um, group of Diplonius. Same with Starnius. The only reason we put them together is they have a Staros. And I'm just going to drill down on this last group, which is Mastogloia. And um, this is not any work that I did, but I'm just, I'm, I'm always struck by uh, the work that um, Paddock and Kemp did on this genus. So we put a variety of things in Mastogloia because they have Partecta. So on the valve, valve copula of uh, Mastogloia species, there's these chambers. This is what they look like externally with these little holes. Here's what they look like internally. And Mastogloia species, many of them through these external holes here, shoot out mucilaginous strands. So there's an unbelievable level of morphological diversification in Mastogloia. And the, and the question is, um, you know, because they have protected, did that, did that adaptation allow for a huge radiation of taxa, or do we are we putting things together in Mastogloia that don't belong? So, I'll just show you a couple of things. This is the external puncta structure. So there are these crazy uh, puncti here. Um, the areola openings have covers on them in this taxon. They're more maybe like what you're used to seeing here in, in uh, uh, openings of areoli. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Paddock and Kemp described 14 different types of areoli uh, within Mastogloia representatives that they studied. Some of them have canopia, some of them don't. Uh, these are the external uh, proximal raphians that, uh, and raphi that you know, can be kind of filiform looking. 
can have a little ridge to it, can have a lot of ridge to it, that are highly undulate, and the, and the undulation is uh, covered by this ridge as well. And in the internal proximal raphians, they can be straight, they can be anchor shaped, they can have helictoglossy. You know, it's like mm, four or five different genera of naviculoid diatoms just represented in these features within what we call mastogloia. And then there are presence of uh, pseudocepti or not, or, or these long um, internal um, borders along the Rafi system as well. So, um, you know, there are, so we put them all together because they have protected, but they have so many other different morphological uh, environments. So is it, is it an example of an adaptive radiation or is this an example, another example of rampant homoplasy with regard to Partecta? I want to know. And they're really horrible to try to culture. So um, you know, looking for, there's also a, a very few number of mastogloias uh, that have been evaluated with molecular data. So overall, I just want to say that uh, there are in, uh, in uh, morphological features, a lot of rampant homoplasy. We can think of them in of the examples that we talked about. Sorry, I spelled monorefid wrong there. Um, and there's a lot of places, a lot of work that we continue to need to do. I've just pointed out a couple of those places in the early diatom tree of life uh, and some certain groups that would be um, uh, welcome focus of folks' attention. In all of that, uh, it is just a great time to be studying diatom taxonomy, systematics, classification, and evolution. Thank you much for your attention. Thank you, Pat, for a great talk. And I'm sure that there will be a lot of questions. And um, maybe we could uh, open up our questions a little bit here. If people want to put something in the chat, you can do that. Or if you would like to ask your question in person, um, raise your hand and I'll, and I'll uh, unmute you and, and uh, you can speak yourself. Um, okay, so while people are getting their nerve up to put their hand <laughs> up, um, Sylvia has a question for you, Pat. Um, she says, you showed both freshwater and marine representatives of several genera. Does salinity influence where taxa are in phylogenetic trees? Well, you know, there's some examples uh, to suggest that that's not the case, that the Rubicon of salinity is not as strong as some authors have suggested. And there's people on this call who could speak to that better than I can. So Marina's written on that and so have other people. So um, uh, the idea that um, we should split genera up by um, whether they're marine or freshwater, I think has been soundly um, um, discounted uh, in a variety of formal analyses. Uh, so um, my answer to that would be no, that's not a good way to, to separate uh, groups based on salinity, genera at least. Okay, come on folks, I know you have questions. Bart says hello. Okay, David, thank you. Um, okay. Um, let me see. Go ahead, David. Hi, does that work? Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Hi, Pat. That was a, a great talk, of course. Um, there, there's, there, there, there's a lot in there. It'd be, be very nice to tackle the issues one at a time. Let me ask you one big question. Um, are we relying entirely on the fact that molecular data are not uh, um, are, are not misleading us? What, why would molecular data not mislead us and morphological data mislead us? So, uh, Dave, the, the really interesting part of this has been that uh, many of the things that I just talked about had been figured out with morphological data. So, uh, the, the, the uh, maybe not to the same degree, but Stormer and I came to a similar conclusion about monorefa diatoms a long time ago. I hate to say that my work goes back a long time, but there were, you know, we did that a long time ago. The amphoroid diatoms were actually done, you know, way back when, 
uh, with, with morphological data. So in most of the cases that I just uh, um, expressed and talked about, there is an actual complementarity to both morphological and molecular data. Now, I know where you're going with this and, uh, you know, do we need to, I've showed a lot of molecular trees and then tried to, you know, put on top of them morphological data. But in fact, um, the, I, you know, something I should have maybe um, underscored was that th there's a lot of support between uh, both approaches when one does a formal analysis. You know, it's, it, it's, it's crazy that we don't have more formal analysis of uh, morphological data. So, um, so in, in the cases where we do that, um, uh, it's, it's so the, um, so uh, I, so do we, so the, I'd say that uh, my answer to your, to that question is more about the formal, formal analyses of molecular data is easier than the formal analysis of morphological data. The data just lend themselves to it. You, you know, you don't have to go say, is this a stigma? And is that a stigma? Are we going to call those the same things or whatever the, some of the things we do in, in morphological studies? So we get more formal analyses out of molecular data, but I'm not suggesting that molecular data lead the way here uh, in these conclusions. Do, do you mind if I, <clears throat> excuse me, do you mind if I offer one other question? Sorry, Sarah, I'm, I'm hogging no, no, Go ahead. Um, let, let's have a guess at this, Pat, if you did it with Diprora. My, my, my guess on that would be, you've got a, a, a thing that's gonna come out with Stereocyraceae, whatever you did. Uh -huh. now, now that's what you, you got some pr pretty good morphological data for that. That defies explanation as far, far as I, I understand. Now, <laughs> let me say, I, I, I think the morphological data is, is not fibbing, it's, it's telling us the truth, telling us something about the relationships and the molecular data is telling some, something about relationships. They, they fundamentally disagree on, with that taxon, absolutely. Uh -huh. In an almost absolute sense. Yes, what, do we do? Yeah. what do we do? Someone's just put a question here about, I thought that was interesting, I'll comment here. Uh, you're inspiring as ever. You are, Pat. And it's, it's the kind of inspiration bordering on desperation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, what, oh, well, you know, look, you know, uh, I'll just say this thing. To do with that. <laughs> I'll just say this, you know, uh, as you get to my age, I, I'm getting, I'm trying to get more evangelical about this in the sense that, uh, you know, I, I can't believe how many of these conferences and talks I've been to where people try to say that this work is not going to get people a job. You know, I can't believe how many times I've heard that. This is important work. This is interesting work. And we as a community have got to, you know, get up and tackle these really interesting topics. And so all I'm trying to do here is point out that there are so many interesting topics and to try to get people aroused in some way to go take that on because I just think there's so much to do, so many interesting things to do and diatoms are an excellent uh, way to, so you could, you could sell yourself as a, you know, uh, somebody who's trying to reconcile morphology and molecular studies, that would be hugely important to a biology department and, uh, and you could do that with diatoms. Okay, Bart. Hi, Pat. Hi. It was a nice talk. Oh, you can see me. It's working. I uh, actually had two questions, but one of them you already kind of answered, because do you really believe that there are genera both in marine and freshwater? Yeah. Do you really think that the genus can be in both? I just said, yeah. 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 <laughs> because I, I, you know, uh, I, doubt, I still doubt that. Uh -huh. And we know for several genera, like Pinellaria, we thought Pinellaria was also in the marine. They're not. The naviculas in the marine seem to look kind of different than the ones in the fresh water. So I really wonder if it really happens. But that was not the main question. The question is, another question I had was, do you think that genera can develop features that become biogeographically delimited so that they will develop into a different genus? Well, I, I don't know exactly what you mean by that, but I'll say that it, it's that I believe that there is endemism in freshwater diatoms at the genus level. And even beyond that, um, several genera within a region. 
So uh, I don't know, uh, a student of mine who is um, working on symboloid diatoms has just done a large morphologically based um, uh, analysis. And there is within the symboloid diatoms, a group, a, a monophyletic group who are restricted to Asia. So yeah. Sorry, I hope you can talk. I, I, I muted you for a second, Bart, because it was there's some echo going. Yeah, that's okay. On. No if you have something to say. No, no, no. But, uh, yeah, because we two years ago we worked on a on a group of naviculas in the group of uh, Navicula gotlandica, and they all had very special features. Um, they had very special features next to the central rave endings, and we found out that. There's a huge amount of taxa in that group only in South America and in, um, what was it, uh, Tasmania and Australia. And one species, Godlandica, who turned up in Europe. So I think that certain genera will start to develop features that drift them away from the, the main big group of genera of the, that genus and then they might turn into one day into a, maybe a different genus and that follows exactly what you said about the symboloids so thanks yeah of course good to see you Bart thank you okay Layla you can go ahead and unmute yourself Hello. Um, I, I want. Uh, you said that the diplonase uh, in fresh water is completely different from diff diplonase in marine environment, uh, and um, you answered uh, uh, that uh, uh, for salinity uh, do not affect. So how you explain this? Uh, and my second question, uh, you said that uh, there is no uh, any evidence that uh, in the evolution we went from uh, arafid to monoraphid to birafid. Um, uh, uh, but uh, are you sure uh, we still have centric first and uh, after how you, uh, you suggest uh, the evolution of that? Thank you. So, um, so there may be splits between marine and fresh water, but as Marina said here in the chat, uh, there are uh, groups of diatoms that, that seem to easily cross the um, salt fresh boundary. And um, Andy Alverson and Ed Terrio's lab has demonstrated that quite nicely in the Thalassiosirales and uh, you know, a wide variety of places. So, um, I'm just saying it's not a hard and fast rule. So there, you know, some people have wanted there to be this kind of hard and fast rule. So of course there will be splits between marine and fresh water, but it's not a, you know, it's not a law, put it that way. And then um, related to uh, the evolution of diatoms and the, the monorafid condition, we don't have any evidence yet, although this Sinoperonia could be a really interesting thing to look at, where um, uh, the primitive raphid diatom had a single raphid system. All of the examples that I pointed to, and the only ones that I know that have been studied, all suggest that the ancestor was bi and and the, uh, the descendant was mono -raphid. We've never seen the previous, the other relationship. Nice to see you, Lila, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Matt. Show your face, Matt. I'm working on it, I'm working on it. <laughs> um, so just, uh, kind of a, first off, great, great talk. Um, uh, but specifically, how, how do we advance from here, right? It's, e it's easy to say, you know, okay, well, like with the uh, the Bacillariales and the the Eunotia and the, the Oxyamphoras, right? Well, taxon sampling. We need to go out. We need to look for more. Well, it's it's a big world out there. It's a big ocean out there. And you know what what are we looking for? Um, you know, maybe you with uh, with Eunotia, you can say, well, we're looking for for 
um, taxa with, with different new combinations of characters, new combinations of the Unotioid Rafe, labiate process, uh, number or position of labiate processes, things like that. Yeah. But with uh, Acnanthes sensu stricto and the Bacillariales and Craspidostaris and Starotropus and all the other things that sort of slide in there, um, I mean, what, what other characters, what other combination of characters could we be looking at to potentially resolve that? If or if we can resolve that. Well, well, let me ask you a question, Matt. So I just I just went. Through, so I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it back on you in some way and say. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, so I just went through this series of, um, you know, uh, statements about morphology and in um, homoplastic. So where are the homo? Where, where is molecular biology taking us to understand homoplasy in molecular data? So where are the analyses of those sequences and those amino acids or where, you know, whatever position, whatever it is that will help us understand uh, uh, how molecular data are homoplastic or not. So we have bootstrap values and things like that, but what about really into the data? Who's doing that? Uh, I, I, would, I would love to know that myself. Nobody. Uh, if for no Nobody. other reason than, uh, uh, it gives a, a talking point with David about yeah. whether or not molecules <laughs> right. are so, leading us astray, right? So, you know, there's there's another place where we could benefit. So um, I would just say that the molecular data have not been um, evaluated in a number of ways, in, in, in part that way. So what uh, what is the nature of the molecular data that puts those groups you mentioned in next to the Bacillary Ailes. Uh, is it is it an artifact of molecular um, data, or is it, uh, or do we really have some strange thing? You know, maybe it's a maybe it is a, a taxon sampling problem, and we just haven't found that group yet. So um, one other thing that um, your question reminded me, Matt, is to say that. Uh, much of what we do is almost unplanned. You know, we happen to find stuff. We luckily get it in culture. And so where are, uh, how can we have a better plan to go out and sample things? And I, you know, I, your, your knowledge of the marine environment is so much deeper and broader than mine. But for me, so for example, in one of these examples, I know where people have to go to study the Unoshiales, you know, and um, and it's not in the Northern Hemisphere. I mean, it'd be useful to have some more representatives of Unosha and, and Semiorbis and some of these other things, but, um, you know, we really need to uh, develop a work plan that involves, that has a bio, let's, let's put it as, I'll, I'll put it in these terms. We need a work plan that has a biogeographic component to it. And um, and I think that that's, that's another value to biogeographic studies. Okay. Uh, I mean, yeah, this, this is probably a, a, a bad question to end the session on because it is very <laughs> open-ended here, <laughs> but, but yeah, just uh, uh, th thanks for that. And I imagine we will, we will be in touch about yeah. things, things along, the, along these lines. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, good, good to see you. Good to see you. Well, thank you, Pat, for a, a great and really interesting talk. <laughs> I'm just kind of struck by the ending there of there is a huge amount of work to do and there's no work plan. The way we've been doing things is um, haphazard maybe of opportunistic of what we can do and um, lots to do and few people to do it. Uh, you know, Sarah, it might be... Um... We, the, uh, we, we do have large groups of people working together, but I think there is maybe uh, to uh, uh, have diatomists look to other work groups in science and see that many of the advances that are being made are very large uh, multinational collaborations. And, um, and we, we, we might need to be thinking along those lines as well. Anyway, thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your day today and uh, 
Um, for some of you, I'll see you later this week. And uh, for all of you, have a great day. And uh, I hope that people in the United States, anyway, will reflect on Sarah's comments she made at the beginning here and see if we can make a difference somehow in our country. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, everyone. And we'll, we'll see you next time. See you in two weeks or sooner. Take care. Bye.